All right. Well, welcome everybody as well. Thanks for thanks for coming. It's a fantastic crowd, and I have the pleasure to stand up here and tell you about some of the work that we're doing here at Gladstone uh, to combat cardiovascular disease. And I want to tell you about two kinds of heart disease: um, congenital heart disease that affects children, and acquired uh, heart disease that affects adults. And what I'm going to tell you about is a mostly a discovery story about how in studying one of these diseases, we have been able to find a potential cure for the other disease. And I won't tell you which one is which uh, right off the bat. And it really is a, a, a journey of discovery and one that's really involved many of the labs up, up on the fourth floor in, in GICD. So first, the number one killer in the Western world is still heart disease. And by heart disease, I mean, I mean mostly heart attacks. So when there's a coronary artery that feeds the heart, that all of a sudden blocks off, and there's a part of the heart muscle tissue that dies off. The good news is that because of advances in surgery and treatment, uh, cardiologists have been able to, to increase the survival rate of heart attacks. There's more and more people who will have a heart attack, but will survive it. And there's public safety measures such as putting defibrillators in public places and things like that that have really helped. But the problem is that of everybody who survives a heart attack, they have a large portion of their heart muscle that has now died off, that is no longer functioning. So the pump function of the heart is diminished. And what that leads to is for every single person who's had a heart attack, it leads to rhythm defects and it eventually leads to heart failure. For example, my father had his heart attack at the age of 43, a couple of years younger than I am now. And right now he has a pacemaker defibrillator that, that keeps him alive once in a while. Um, but his, his heart is, gradu is gradually failing. And so it's one of the, the biggest unsolved clinical problems in cardiology is the failing heart. And we don't have a solution to deal with this right now. There are millions of Americans that are affected, and it's something that's, that's really not stopping, and it's actually it's, it's, it's an epidemic. And so we're, we really want to do something about this here at Gladstone. And before I tell you what we're doing about it, I want to tell you about the other disease that, that we're studying, which is congenital heart disease, very different kind of disease. Congenital heart disease is the diseases of the formation of the heart. So 1% of children, one out of, one out of 100 live births, um, a child is born with a structural defect, a hole in their heart. It is the number one cause, non, the mo number one non-infectious cause of death in the first year of life. It's really quite tremendous. Uh, there are more deaths due to congenital heart disease than there are diagnoses of pediatric cancers. It really is a serious problem. Um, there, it comes in many forms. There are many different severities. It, it turns out my daughter was born with, with a hole between her, her ventricles. It was a moderate size, and we we're fortunate that it closed by itself with, without significant sequelae. So we, we were on sort of on the, the, the sort of the mild end of, of that spectrum. Um, there's a, a gentleman uh, who's a partner at Google Ventures who's been blogging about his son's congenital heart defects. And he um, sadly announced this week that his son, who's 11 years old, died of complications of a third open heart surgery that this boy uh, was undergoing for a very complex heart defect. So there, there's, there's a wide spectrum uh, of severities, and it really is something that, that affects families. One out of 100 kids are born with these heart defects. The, the really, uh, one of the really sad parts about it is that we, despite decades of research, we don't really understand how these defects arise. Um, when, when our daughter was, was diagnosed with, with her defect at her two-week checkup, uh, my wife asked me, she says, how does, how does this happen? You know, why does this happen? And despite having researched this for now for 15 years, uh, having written a chapter in a book about it, the only answer I could, could give her was, well, we don't really know. We don't really know how it happens and what we can do about it. And that, to me, is profoundly unacceptable. So what are we doing to address this? Well, we figured that the best way to understand how a heart doesn't form normally is to understand how it forms normally in the first place. So if we understand all the right instructions that, that nature uses to put a heart together, we could then 
unravel it, pull it apart, and figure out why it goes wrong one out of 100 times. And so in, in my lab upstairs and in collaboration with other er, folks upstairs, we've been trying to decipher what we call the genetic blueprint of the heart. So what do I mean by the genetic blueprint? What I mean is all the genetic instructions that are deployed during the formation of the heart to tell a heart cell to become a heart cell and to then drive all the movements that a heart needs to undergo to form itself right 99% of the time. So what exactly, let me tell you a bit about what I mean by a genetic blueprint. And for, and for this, I've got to take you to biology class for, for, a, couple, for a couple of minutes. Um, we have about 200 different cell types in our body. We have brain cells, we have hair cells, we have skin cells, heart cells, muscle cells, and so on. Each of those 200 different kinds of cells has the same genetic instructions. So each cell has the potential to, in, to, to instruct a, a cell to be any cell it wants. And so what happens in, in the embryo is that there are switches that are thrown so that a cell that's gonna become a heart cell gets all the switches thrown in place so that it gets the instructions to become only a heart cell instead of a liver cell or a brain cell. And the same thing, the cells in, in the, are to become the brain get all the, a different set of switches that are thrown to give rise to, to a brain cell. And so that's what we refer to as the genetic blueprint. It's those genetic instructions, those sets of switches that get set so that you get a heart cell in your heart and you get your brain cells in your brain and that your organs form all together. So we're in the process of trying to figure out this genetic blueprint of the heart. Now, how do we use it to understand congenital heart disease? Well, it turns out that of the known genetic causes of, genetic, of, of congenital heart disease are genes that encode proteins that are involved in setting those switches. And so congenital heart disease is really a defect of setting up this blueprint of these switches that normally all fall, all turn on and off in the right place at the right time, getting thrown aberrantly. And so what we're doing in the lab, we're tr now that we have at least a, so far sort of a rough blueprint of the heart, we're trying to understand what happens when these switches aren't thrown properly, what happens to the formation of the heart. And in the last few years, we've made some really exciting discoveries in just understanding how the heart comes together and then only in the last few months, we've really understood how at least one of those switches is directly involved in how the heart forms abnormally in congenital heart disease. So it's this, we're in this process of discovery right now, and in a few years, I think we'll know a heck of a lot more than, we'll, than we've ever known in the last 15 years about how the heart forms normally and how this genetic blueprint goes wrong in the cases of congenital heart disease. So that's sort of the progress that we're making so far. It's very early days in, in trying to even think of a cure for a congenital heart disease. But in the process of understanding this blueprint, we had a crazy idea about five or six years ago. Collectively, many of us thought, okay, we're in the process of understanding all the instructions that nature uses to make a heart cell and to put a heart together. Could we, if we were bold enough, figure out what the instructions are that we could use, that we could harness to make new heart cells and fix a diseased heart. Could that even be possible? It was a crazy idea at the time because obviously a lot of people had thought about doing this. It seems like something, that, something obvious that one should, should think about doing and yet nobody had succeeded. So we had one hint that it might be possible. Experiments that, that, came, that came out of, of our lab had shown that at least in the embryo, we could take a few instructions, not many, three or four, and, and drive the cells in the embryo that would be, normally become bone or, or, or muscle and turn those cells into heart. So we knew that we could somehow influence cells to become another kind of cell, in this case a heart cell, exactly the cell type that we were thinking about making. So Deepak Srivastava's lab, right next door to us, was inspired by the success that another GICD, another Gladstone star, Shinya Yamanaka, the approach that Shinya had used to harness the power, the instructions, the blueprint, if you will, of embryonic stem cells to be able to take skin cells and turn them into what you all may have heard of as induced pluripotent cells, these cells that were made from the skin that are basically identical to embryonic stem cells. And so folks in, in Deepak Srivastava's lab thought, 
we could, if we could use that approach, think about using the instructions that we know that make a heart cell, could we again take those sets of factors and push a cell that isn't a heart cell and make a new beating heart cell? This so was a complete shot in the dark experiment. And I remember sitting in the room when, when uh, the postdoc from Deepak's lab was showing the first success that he had. He had taken, I think, 20 different kind of master regulatory factors and put them into cells called, we call fibroblasts. These are the cells that are normally sitting in the heart, just sitting, giving structure to the heart. But then in the heart attack, those are the cells that make the scar tissue, <coughs> that scar tissue that, that doesn't work, that, that gives you the impaired heart function. And he was able to show that with a tiny little percentage that throwing in these 20 factors could turn on a, a gene that's normally turned on only in the heart. And we thought, gosh, this, is, this, this can't be right. This can't be working. And he worked at it, he worked at it, he whittled it down to three factors, three master regulators that in a dish, he could get about 20% of these fibroblasts that normally are not beating heart cells and turn them into what looked, for all intents and purposes, like <coughs> heart cells, heart cell, that cells that would have come uh, from a heart. And we thought, well, that's, you know, that's absolutely fantastic, but can you use that to fix a heart that's had a heart attack, where there's a scar, where there's a permanent loss of the heart muscle, a permanent loss of heart function? And so another postdoc in Deepak's lab took on that task, and she worked very hard to uh, inject these factors into the hearts of mice that have been given tiny little heart attacks, but very similar to, what, to, to the heart attacks that, that, that people get. And lo and behold, she was able to get new heart tissue, and she was able to show that this new heart tissue came from these fibroblasts, these scar tissue cells. So she had, in fact, been able to convert the cells, the cells that you don't want there, the cells that form the scar tissue, and convert them into new beating heart cells. Not only that, but when they measured the function of the heart of these mice, the heart function, the pumping ability of the heart, the squeeze that you need to, to keep blood flowing in the body was almost back to normal levels compared to the severe loss of heart function that were in the mice that hadn't received those, those master regulatory factors. <coughs> so here was an instance where we were able to completely regenerate, not completely, but to regenerate heart, lost heart muscle, something that had never been done before, in a heart attack and regenerate heart function. And get this, the best part of it, at least for me, the best part of it, I think, is that this is a permanent restoration of heart function. So there's no need, it's not a drug that you have to take every day, it's not, it's not a surgery that you have to get done every five years, it's a permanent restoration of heart function. Now keep in mind this is in mice. It works a certain percentage of the time, and it involves a gene therapy type approach. So this needs to get better. So what are we doing? So we're taking really a team approach upstairs to really attack this and the genetic blueprint in order to together bring together the, all the knowledge that we possibly have upstairs to these two problems. And so for example, Sheng Ding's lab, who's a, a chemist who works on stem cells upstairs, he's been able to do this exact reprogramming, this converting these fibroblasts into new heart cells using only chemicals, only small molecules, drugs, some of them already FDA approved, without a need for a gene therapy approach. So now the dream is, can we take these small molecules, can we just put in a drug in the right place for long enough to, to, to fix the heart? And then pretty much every single lab on the fourth floor, my lab, Deepak's lab, Sheng's lab, Nevin Krogan's lab, Bruce Conklin's lab, Katie Pollard's lab are all getting together as a team effort to really try to really fully understand this, this genetic blueprint of the heart. Now we have sort of a scaffold right now, we have kind of an idea, but if we really want to, to use precision biology to understand congenital heart defects, and then to be able to, to know what exactly are all the right switches that we can use to regenerate the heart, we really need to, to understand everything. And so we've got this broad team approach. But one of the really fun things that's going on is that, of course, we're not limiting ourselves to mice. 
Um, mice have hearts that are very different from ours. And so now what Deepak's lab is doing is that they're extending this approach, this gene therapy approach to regenerate hearts to hearts that are more like ours in size and in function. And so they're doing this now in pig hearts. And pig hearts are, uh, pigs are obviously very large. We don't just house them upstairs. We have special places. Um, but so far, and then the surgeries are more complicated and, and, and sort of challenging than, than what we can do with the mice. But so far, the results are encouraging. We don't know yet if it's really, really going to work. Um, but the results so far indicate that what was working in a mouse heart is working in a pig heart. I, sh I should parenthesize that this is also spectacularly expensive. We're fortunate to have uh, support from agencies like, like CIRM and NIH uh, to do some of this work. But we're really relying on the generosity of, of, of a few donors that have expressed keen interest in, in seeing this really work. And so I'm going to leave you then with this, with this notion that we've come through this pathway of discovery, studying two completely unrelated types of diseases, and in studying one, the path of discovery has really brought us to a potential cure uh, for, for another, and this other one being the number one killer in the Western world. And so if it works, it's still a big if, but if it works, it's a complete game changer, and it really, hopefully, will change how uh, we treat people with heart disease in the future. And so that's how we went from studying congenital heart disease through the genetic blueprint to a potential cure in regenerating hearts. Thanks for your time.